everybody. Welcome to this event on populism and the rise of autocracy. This is one of the regular policy and practice events organized by UCL's Department of Political Science, which run weekly during term time. This particular event is a joint event being hosted alongside the Constitution Unit, which is the department's longest established research center. My name is Meg Russell. I'm Professor of British and, uh, British and Comparative Politics in the department and the director of the Constitution Unit. And I'm gonna be chairing this event this evening. I'm really delighted that we're holding this event, which is on an issue of such burning political importance. And we've got a truly stellar panel of speakers with us this evening. I'll briefly introduce our three speakers and then I'll just go through a few logistics for the evening before we get going. So our first speaker will be Anne Applebaum, who's a journalist, author, and fellow of the Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. She's a staff writer at The Atlantic, a former deputy editor of The Spectator, and a longtime columnist for The Washington Post. Her latest book published this year is called Twilight of Democracy, The Failure of Politics and the Parting of Friends. And it's a fascinating, compulsively readable, chilling and important account of recent shifts on the center right of politics in the US, Europe and beyond, and the tendency towards populism and authoritarianism. Nadia Urbinati is our second speaker. She's a political theorist and professor at Columbia University. She's one of our most important academic commentators on democracy and has written numerous important books, including on representative democracy and on populism. Her most recent book published last year is entitled Me the People, How Populism Transforms Democracy. And as a spoiler alert, her previous book identified populism as one of the things currently disfiguring democracy. Rory Stewart, our third speaker, is a former UK Member of Parliament and Conservative Cabinet Minister, as well as a former diplomat and celebrated author. He was Secretary of State for International Development under Theresa May, and a candidate for leader of the party against Boris Johnson when she stepped down as Prime Minister, somewhat electrifying the contest and gathering a huge popular following, in part by telling some hard truths about politics. In 2019, he left the House of Commons and he's now a fellow at Yale University. Each of the panelists is going to address us for just a few minutes at the start, after which we'll have some discussion amongst us as a panel. After that, we'll open it up to audience questions. How the questioning will work, um, ch the chat function is disabled for attendees at the meeting. So if you've got a question, put it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Attendees won't be able to turn their camera on, but if your question is selected, we'll invite you to unmute and ask it for yourself. If you prefer me or somebody else to read your question, then put that into the, into the Q&A function when you uh, put your question there. The Twitter hashtag for this event is hashtag populism SPP. And you can follow us on Twitter handles uh, at, at UCL SPP and at comunit underscore UCL. This event's being recorded and it'll be available afterwards on our website and on all major podcast platforms. We'll send the links out in a follow-up email shortly after the event uh, to all of you who attended, so please do share them. I'm tremendously grateful to our three wonderful panelists for being with us this evening, and I'm going to start by handing over to Anne Applebaum for her opening remarks. I wonder, Anne, if you could just outline the core arguments in your recent book. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you, you know, spiritually and virtually, even if, if not physically, and um, I hope someday to rejoin um, this audience physically again. Um, I've always liked talking to, um, to the University of London. Um, my book is, I mean, it's funny that this is an event on populism. Uh, um, my book did not use the word populism once. Um, I sought to avoid the term as I thought that it was, it had been overused, it had been misdefined, it was being thrown around over the last three years. And I wanted to describe something a little bit different. Um, it's very useful that I'm talking from this room. I'm, I'm right now in Poland. Um, I'm in a house that my husband and I renovated. Um, we bought it, it was a total ruin. It was the roof had caved in. Um, it, it, we bought it in the late 1980s. And over the course of the 1990s, um, we fixed it up. And by about 1999, 
there was a roof on it, um, you could be inside it, uh, but there was no furniture, at least not in this room, there was no furniture. Um, and we decided at that moment to have a New Year's Eve party, partly to celebrate the house, partly to bring together friends and colleagues from the US, from the UK, um, from Poland, most of whom at that time I would have described as being part of a kind of broad center-right coalition. These were anti-communists, these were people who were, had worked to make Poland a democracy, um, had worked to expand the transatlantic alliance. Um, these were people who felt to me like they were at that time all on the same page. Um, a couple of years ago, I started to think about that party and um, I realized that not just in Poland um, and not just in UK and not just in the US, but in other places too, that coalition had come apart. Um, and the people who were on the center right or would I've described as the, as a, you could have called them liberals, you could have called them Thatcherites, classical liberals, you could have called them in America Reaganites, you could have called them anti-communists in Poland. That, that group had actually begun to splinter um, so much so that many of the people who were at that party in 1999 are no longer speaking to other people who were at the same party in 1999. And these weren't personal divisions, they were political and the center right had divided quite deeply. And in the book, I talk about some of the people, I, I talk about some of the changes and the way in which the right in so many countries has split into different groups. And each country is not the same, but there are echoes of similar problems and similar impulses in all of them. Um, and above all, what the book is about is a sense of disappointment that a lot of people on the right had beginning in the 1990s and then sometimes picking up pace after that. And it was a disappointment in, you know, in Poland, it was a disappointment with Polish democracy. Um, you know, in, in the UK, it was a disappointment with the nature of modern Britain um, the, the, the powerlessness of Britain in, in the context of Europe, um, that we had to negotiate so many things, that we weren't our own country as we once were. Um, in the United States, it was a disappointment with the nature of modern American democracy, with multicultural democracy, with, um, with many of the cultural and social changes that had taken place over the previous couple of decades. And a part of that group reacted very strongly against not only their political systems and not only the current state of affairs, but in some cases against the democratic system itself. And they began to question, you know, do we, do we really like the way things are going? Um, weren't things better, weren't some things better in the past? Um, you had a wave of restorative nostalgia in, in a number of countries. You had a desire for much more extreme and radical change. As I said, it's not the same in every country. It doesn't, it, it's not a, it, there's not a carbon copy of this phenomenon everywhere, but the turn towards something different, the desire for something more radical um, has taken a part of the right um, in, in, many, in many democracies, um, not only Western democracies, but in democracies around the world, off in a, in, a, in a different direction. And the book describes that and, and seeks to put that shift in a bigger context. Um, this is something that periodically happens um, in, in, you know, sort of in the course of human events. Um, political alliances realign themselves, friends change, parties break up. And I believe that and really not populism is what we've experienced over the last several years. Thank you very much. That's a terrific introduction. I, I, having read the book and really enjoyed the book, I, I feel like that was really atmospheric for me, recalling that party again. It's a, it's a terrific framing and there's the party at the end of the book as well. Maybe you'll come to that at the end of the event. I'd like to turn to Nadia now, who um, very unashamedly uses the term populism. It appears in the title of her latest book. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that you emphasize, it's really interesting to me as the director of the Constitution Unit, is how populism is essentially an anti-political force. And it's also a force that pushes against liberal constitutionalism. I wonder if you, you do that really forensically. I wonder if you could set out some of those arguments as initial context for us. Yes, thank you so much for having me here. And, um... And I like to continue the conversation, although I use the word populism actually 
many times and in my titles also and since many years this is i started 25 years ago almost anyway i use it also because it is a, a very ordinary word now you cannot have all. but leaving aside the reason why i, I use it the question is that uh, populism belongs to democracy and has to do with the changing character that democratic societies and democratic institutions um, have is a changing character. The, the democratic uh, uh, representative democracy in particular are not static entities that either they remain as they are or they break down. They are very elastic because uh, representation is capable of uh, absorbing, changing, uh, interacting with society and civil movements and parties, but they can change in the way in which I think today we see dramatically a change. And we see this change and this is something new because populism is not new. It started in the 19th century along with democracy and with democratization, but this time is new because wherever we are both in uh, the West and the rest, as we say, that is in uh, central, uh, uh, in uh, Western democracy and um, peripheral kind of uh, democratic experiences, we see this phenomenon. So from Caracas to Budapest to uh, Washington to Rome, wherever you go, you have this phenomenon and they try to understand what kind of phenomenon. So I make a distinction between uh, movements uh, which are like many other movements, a part of the democratic uh, dialectics after all. And I analyze instead what populism does once it becomes a majority and can rule uh, a government. So this distinction allows me to skip and to also avoid all the long uh, kind of medieval uh, scholastic uh, uh, definition what is populism what is populism this essentialistic use of what is that and instead i try to uh, show that of course since it is inside of democracy we know what democracy is although populism can be can take different forms in relation to the kind of democracy it's uh, contesting now today uh, we have to analyze what it does to a democracy that is based on pluriparty, on a constitution, with the constitutions, division of power, the rule of law, and some basic rights which are not in the hand of a majority, elected majority. So this is a kind of democracy in relation to which I analyze the change that constitution, uh, uh, populism is capable of making. And the change are visible wherever we go, and they are characteristic of uh, a, a kind of uh, different forms of representation. Look at represent representative democracy is strongly based on political movements or political parties because it's a form of constructions of claims from the bottom, from society, to translate them into the institutions and to create a, this circulation of opinions between inside and outside without converging them, without uh, closing the gap. This is what the representation has been until now as party-based representation. What populism does, it is an attack on this uh, uh, kind of fragment, fragmenting the people in order to weakening the people. And they try to unify the people and to make the people one under a leader, not under a party, not necessarily, or if under a party is a party that is in the end of the leader and in the service of the leader. This new form of representation changes many things. And I think it can change in a bad way somehow. So we may have two forms of populistic change of this constitutional democracy, although populism remains within the limits of constitutional democracy. Otherwise, this would be another regime. It would, it would be fascism, autocracy, something else. But this is a stretching of the constitutions to its extreme border, but still within those famous borders. Now, um, two forms the populist leaders can take. One, they declare, I am the people. Here I come to Washington. It's not me that I come to Washington. It's the real people coming to Washington. Do we remember uh, you know, uh, uh, Trump in 2000, four years ago? Yes. So what is that? It's that when a, a, a populist leader is capable of uh, convincing people, persuading people that is not an only, is not an establishment like other establishment, is actually an anti-establishment. Is the real people is the voice of the real people? 
these leaders, once in power, it, he has to make an effort to be in a kind of permanent electoral campaign every day in order to prove his people that is never and it will never be a new establishment. So while in government is a mobilizing, while in government is like in the opposition, and they cover the political leaders in power, they cover all of all the roles, the roles of the rulers in the majority and the roles of the opposition. They do all the games. And finally, if they can, and in some cases in my country, Italy, but also in other cases in Eastern Europe, and in other cases in Latin America, if they can, they change the constitution. They change the constitution not by abolishing uh, elections. Populism is not fascist. I resist all this, uh, this analogy. is very misled, uh, according to me. But uh, they use elections as a way of celebrating, and actually they use more and more if they can, celebrating the victory of the leader. So, and they do so in a way that can shatter the system uh, by strengthening the moment of decision making versus collective bodies like the parliament, and can change also the tenor of political discourse in society without necessarily repressing oppositions, uh, sending to jail enemies, but uh, transforming uh, the, the language of politics into a language of uh, chastising, uh, attacking, uh, humiliating the opposition, so as to create a kind of uh, boxing uh, way of discussing instead of uh, dialogue between oppositions and majorities or oppositions and uh, and a ruling majority. So this is a kind of a tenor of democracy changing. Some institutions that are stressing in an apex toward the, the, um, the uh, executive power more than the parliament, see what, uh, that, what uh, Orban has done in June, uh, suspending the parliament for a while, you know, that to have free reign on, this, um, man on the managing of the emergency power because of the COVID and so on and so forth. So I think that if we analyze um, populism, abandoning, for me is bad at least, abandoning the habit of using it as a polemical term, because it doesn't help us. We, we should make an effort to analyze this phenomenon as a transformation internal to democracy with a risk, a very close risk of going well beyond that. This would be a risk. Now, final, just one line. What is the paradox of this populistic democracy? First, the paradox is that it cannot stabilize because either this, major, this new majority, this, this elected populist leader, either he or the majority becomes an ordinary one, like, like the, 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 the former ones before against which uh, he mobilized at the beginning, you no? Know? or it goes well beyond an outside democracy. So the paradox of this system is, the, is that it's a, in a permanent motions and in a very difficult, um, hard time to stabilize the system. And this is pre perhaps one of the most uh, interesting phenomena that we see today, I use interesting without any attempt to make an evaluation on that. We can then accept to evaluate, of course, but this is uh, my first round. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nadia. There's a huge amount in there. And I mean, I think you, um, you put this emphasis on the tension between populism needs democracy and yet populism potentially yes. destroys democracy. And if you stretch the constitution too far, I mean, I've used the word chilling this evening already in relation to Anne's book. If you stretch it too far, you're, you're at risk of tipping into authoritarianism, right. tipping into fascism, you say very clearly. I want to turn to Rory now and give him a chance to introduce. Rory, I don't know where you want to take this. You're obviously, you're sitting in Yale, you're in the States, you're in what is still Trump's uh, America. Uh, you came from Boris Johnson's Britain. Um, how much of this do you recognize from your political life um, in that very important space that Anne describes in her book of the center right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I think the first thing is that you've got a very interesting panel here because you've got voices from Kaczynski's Poland, you've got voices from Salvini's Italy, you've got voices from Trump's America, you've got, and you're sitting in Boris Johnson's Britain. So there's a, there's a lot of interesting things going on there. Um, I think the first thing is my sense of this is that um, it's a real phenomenon. I mean, 
I, the, the question of how exactly you describe it is, is I think, as, as Nadia suggests, a piece of theology. But it is a real phenomenon. And it's firstly a very surprising phenomenon because traditionally my colleagues here in Yale who are political scientists tend to traditionally think that the precise design of a constitution, right, the way you separate powers, for example, has a real impact on the type of politics that you end up with. What's so odd about this phenomenon is it seems to be happening in these very diverse countries. It seems to be happening in places with completely different types of constitution. Uh, and it seems to suggest to me, therefore, that this is a much, much broader, wider, cultural, almost global phenomenon. And I'm not gonna go too deeply into where it's coming from, but amongst the elements that you might want to look at, are the fact that the tremendous success, for example, of authoritarian countries like China has shaken a little bit a 200 year consensus that economic growth and liberal democracies necessarily went alongside each other. I think there is a continuing decline in our confidence in our own moral values. I think social media has a part to play in all of this. But whatever the root causes are, it's a very, very real phenomenon. And it's a phenomenon where I just want to focus on one thing that struck me particularly in politics, which is the link between our moral evaluation, right, our sense of whether or not politicians are good people, and the way we think about politics. So one of the things that's very striking about the way that people are voting, whether they're voting for Donald Trump or whether they're voting for Boris Johnson, is that most of those people voting are for different reasons not particularly troubled by the question of the individual's moral character. And I'm not saying these people are monstrous figures. I mean, they, uh, Nadia is probably right to say that you know, they, they exist within a tradition and they're not to be compared to Mussolini, right? But nevertheless, these are clearly people with significant character flaws. Nevertheless, their voters vote for them. They vote for them partly maybe that uh, we're so depressed in general about politicians that we've lost the idea there could even be a good politician, so it doesn't really matter. In fact, this is one of the hypotheses that Boris Johnson produces. He says, the reason people like my speeches, the reason people like me is that they think all politicians are schmucks. And the great thing about me, he says, is that at least I acknowledge my schmuckiness. Whereas these other people, you know, if, I don't know, Keir Starmer or Theresa May is pretending to be kind of diligent or serious. Many people in the public think, well, this person must be trying to fool me. I mean, obviously they can't be diligent, they can't be serious because we know that politicians are idle, corrupt and incompetent. Um, why though is this a problem? I mean, I, I could get into the question of how we morally evaluate politicians and what we make of this question. And this is a very deep question that we can't resolve now, but you know, is Machiavelli right? That somehow in actually to succeed, to do well in politics, uh, you need to learn how to be bad. Um, but the, the problem here is particularly with this type of populism is that it seems to me there is a tendency in these democracies to massively uh, emphasize features which were always there, particularly a particular desire to win elections by almost any means necessary. And certain views of loyalty to leader which were always there, right? and they're always implicit in British democracy going all the way back to the late 19th century. But when it uh, metastasizes, when it becomes so giant in the consciousness of politicians, it takes out of their normal processes and thoughts the things that they would require to govern well. In other words, there's a tension between the way in which elections are won, the way in which you get promoted in the party, and what it takes to govern well. And this is not just true of uh, states like Hungary and Poland, which in some ways are beginning to feel as though they have the features of one party states. Right? And they have features of a kind of Bulgarian communist party where the only way to get ahead is to be loyal. The same is of course true you know, within the British Conservative Party. If you look at the British cabinet, increasingly any idea that your cabinet is a team of rivals of different views of great figures in the party have been replaced by a basic idea that your qualification is to be a loyalist. And the problem of this course is, is uh, threefold and I'll finish on this. It makes it difficult for populist governments to respond thoughtfully and intelligently to particular crises, problems like COVID, for example. 
because their entire way of thinking about the world, which is we are the people, we're fighting the establishment, we've won this on a three word slogan, an entire style of campaigning that is contemptuous of expertise, technocracy, makes it very difficult when they have to sit around a table and have a complicated conversation uh, with epidemiologists about exactly how they're going to respond to this, right? Now, they can respond in two different ways. Some of the populists respond by simply rejecting the science altogether. Others like Boris Johnson respond by claiming they're listening to the experts. But these are both the same phenomenon. They're both abrogations of responsibility. They're both an unwillingness to engage in detail with the question of technocratic expertise. The second problem uh, that they uh, face is that because they can use the three word slogan to create a sort of hyper hysterical fake ideological sense, they can propagate things like Brexit, quite dramatic things on the public. Right? They unleash these things which seem to excite us. Excite us maybe partly because for some people they were fed up with a world without ideology. They were fed up with a world where there seemed to be just a consensus bubbling along and elites talking about it. And the third problem is that in many cases they will be tempted towards profligacy partly because of their inability to actually manage the economy properly or manage crises like coronavirus properly or inability to want to talk about the details of borders and Brexit, they will be tempted to spend an extraordinary amount of money. It doesn't matter that they may technically come from the right. And the things they will spend money on will of course, you know, look at the UK, right? Suddenly decided to massively increase defense spending. And we're now buying these very expensive few naval vessels for what? What's the purpose of these things? What are we doing? We're going to take a little flotilla and sail off to defend Taiwan against China? Nobody knows, right? It, it doesn't, doesn't matter, right? We're just spending money. We're just spending money. So the thing that binds this together, my analytical connection between these things, if I'm going to try to be a bit more rigorous, is that fundamentally it's a problem with the ethics of responsibility. If you are perpetually campaigning as the outsider against the establishment, the entire notion of responsibility goes out of the window. And with that goes a lot of other things, certain kinds of ethical considerations, say ideas of right and wrong, ideas of technocratic competence, but above all, the things that bind the moral and the practical together, the idea of governing well which depends on responsibility and populism is the enemy in a sense of responsibility. Thank you. That was fascinating and brilliant, Rory. And um, it makes me so pleased that we brought this panel together because I was, I was hoping we'd have exactly these kind of conversations. Um, let me just uh, quickly make an appeal to the audience. Um, if this is stimulating your thoughts and you want to ask questions to the panel, do please put them in Q&A. Actually say what your question is um, and then we'll try and select questions which fit with each other in, in groups. Um, but for the meantime, let's have a bit of a conversation amongst us while the questions are starting to come in. I was very struck, Anne, that you used the term disappointment, that you, you think that this, this fracture in politics comes from a sense of disappointment. And that resonates with me because I actually, I actually wrote a pamphlet 15 years ago under the title, Must Politics Disappoint? Um, it was a pamphlet written for the UK Fabian Society, and it had a preface from Bernard Crick, who back in the 1960s had written a famous book called In Defense of Politics. And what Crick was talking about was how politics is fundamentally a messy business, which is all about compromise and negotiation and not everybody getting what they want. And I think that you, Anne, in your book, touch on this when you say you quote us some psychological studies about how authoritarianism appeals to people who don't like complexity, who want things to be simple. And it feels to me like that's what Rory's talking about as well. And Rory, when you were running in the conservative leadership contest, you talk about Boris Johnson presenting himself as a kind of anti-politician and, and being a populist is kind of being an anti-politician, that you were being countercultural as well in a funny way by actually standing up for politics. You were the person in that context who was saying, look, this is complicated. Brexit, we're going to have to compromise. And what was really interesting and exciting about that was that it was popular. So I suppose an initial question to the panel is you all seem to see populism as an anti-political movement, but can we reclaim politics? Can we do something with Rory's campaign to actually stand up for complexity and for negotiation? 
Rory, would you like to go first? Because that was your experience. And then I'll, I'll bring Anne and Nadia in on that. I mean, it's very sweet of you to say that. I mean, the, the truth of the matter was that <laughs> it was ultimately unsuccessful. So <laughs> there is a bit of a problem with this, with this model. Um, I mean, you're, you're right, to some extent, it was not popular. successful I, with I, the Conservative Party, but it was pretty yeah. successful with the public at large. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. So these, uh, there was a moment where I was ahead in the opinion polls, but it definitely did not help me to win the leadership of the Conservative Party. Um, I think, um, and, and there, is, there, there are some reasons why uh, trying to argue for compromise and complexity is tricky. And one of them is uh, some very basic facts, which I think political scientists have done really good work on, on, on the psychology of voters and on the ways in which um, there are parts of our brain, our political brains, which quite like binary opposition, which quite like a world of defining the other as being morally reprehensible and alien, uh, quite like the clarification of difference, right? Uh, I mean, some, some very, very smart, very successful, much more successful than me politicians have, um, have focused on this. I mean, Bismarck is very interested in this. He says, you know, you get somewhere in politics by finding the, the moment of division and difference and emphasizing conflict. Uh, so I think, um, although, of course, I agree passionately with Bernard Crick and with you, Meg, and indeed the entire reason I became a politician is that I think the entire glory of our system is pluralism and skepticism about your own views and embracing within bounds a very wide variety of different values and views. I say within bounds because obviously there are people who are very bad people who are outside those bounds, but within those bounds, and that what it seemed to me was most urgent after Brexit was acknowledging this was a 52-48 vote. So I wanted a 52-48 Brexit, a soft Brexit, right? That tried to harmonize, bring people together, not divide them. Um, I discovered that it felt as though public opinion had gone from a sort of bell jar where the votes were in the middle to a sort of U shape where the votes are on the edges. And I was sitting down on the bottom of the U, like a sort of collapsed blanc manche. And that I think is partly a feature of just how brilliant this style of Salvini, Johnson, Trump campaigning is, right? How, how they've sort of discovered or rediscovered a trick which people have been ignoring for many years, maybe because it was socially unacceptable, which is that it was fine. And I'll finish on this, but it, 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 I mean, the, the classic moment for me in that whole campaign was Boris kept saying, we're gonna leave on the 31st of October. And I kept saying, how, right? I mean, obviously there was no way that he could leave on the 31st of October. And obviously he didn't leave on the 31st of October. He couldn't do it. Couldn't do it because it was clear that parliament wouldn't let him leave on the 31st of October. So I would try to say in all these debates, but how are you going to leave if parliament doesn't let you do that, right? Are you gonna prorogue parliament? Right. No, 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 I'm not going to parade parliament. Right. Are you going to hold an election? No, I'm not going to hold an election. So I'm going to do this, right? But of course, he didn't need to answer me. He just needed to repeating that he was going to leave on the 31st of October. And he didn't need to worry about the fact that he says he isn't going to parade parliament, he parade parliament, he says he's going to hold an election, he's going to hold an election. None of that matters because um, whatever this thing is, whatever this rhetoric of political debate is, it isn't a sort of logical debate where you can be like, aha, I've caught you out. You said you were going to leave on the 31st of October, but you can't, right? So nobody's going to vote for you. It doesn't quite work like that. Okay, finish for me. And you remind me in, in saying that, that you were, in, in being a defender of politics in that context, you were very explicitly being a defender of parliament. And of course, parliament is the key thing that I study. And like Nadia, I'm a defender of representative democracy as the only form of democracy that in practice is going to work. Um, but Parliament is a place where complexity happens. And do you want to come in on this, this idea of simplicity and complexity and whether we can, whether complexity can win this argument? Sure. I mean, there was one thing I wanted to add to what Rory said in his, in his opening statement, which is, he was talking about the appeal of the immoral politician or of the, you know, somebody who we know cheated on his wife or somebody who we know was a corrupt businessman in the case of Donald Trump. Um, and I wanted to 
um, say that there's a that that there is a part of the population for which that very um, that immorality and that um, you know even illegality is appealing. It's not just that people excuse it; it's that it was part of the appeal. It was. To, to the people who are, as I said, disappointed, to people who want to smash the system, to people who don't really believe in democracy anymore and aren't invested anymore in the institutions of democracy, then that kind of politician who, who is implicitly or explicitly sometimes, Trump is now explicitly doing this, um, promising to smash up the system is, is the appeal. I mean, they're breaking the taboo. I get nothing out of the system. You know, why should I mean, th this is what radicalism always is, whether it's the left wing radicalism of the past or the right wing radicalism of the present. Um, it's a promise by somebody that I'm going to throw everything up in the air, smash it up um, and start again. And so I think, you know, what we're talking about and again, I, 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 one should maintain nuances between different countries, but certainly in the United States, we are talking about a part of the American population um, that finds Trump appealing because it simply doesn't believe in democracy at all anymore. And you can see in the, um, you know, what's going on right now with Trump claiming, you know, that the election was stolen, even though he has no proof and some percentage of Americans, some we don't know, you know, it's not clear how many it's going to be in the long term, are going to continue believing that for a long time because they've stopped believing in the whole um, in the whole thing. So so part of what um, anti-populist or in my, see, I don't like the word populist because I think what we're talking about is authoritarianism. Um, what authoritarianist, anti-authoritarian, you know, pluralist politics has to do is aside from or in addition to what Rory's talking about, which is reminding people of the value and need for expertise um, is also, um, you know, rekindling some kind of faith in the system, um, reminding people of some kind of communal values. Um, what is it that we all stand for together? Um, this was part of what Joe Biden's election campaign was about. Um, if you watched his ads, you know, they were images of familiar images of America. There was one ad I remember that was about family um, and it showed Biden with his sons, and then it showed other people with their children, you know, ordinary working Americans in, from different parts of the country, you know, with different kinds of backgrounds and landscapes, um, and trying to turn people away from this policy of division, the politics of division, and towards some kind of, you know, conversation about what are our goals together? What can we do together? What can we actually achieve together? Um, getting people to move away from the politics of confrontation and particularly from these very dangerous culture wars um, and to focus on joint projects. I mean, I don't know, getting people to build roads together or in America create a actual functional healthcare system or, I mean, you know, um, you know, focusing on real projects, real things that will affect people's lives and convincing people to focus on that um, that, you know, in, in, the, in the few cases where you've seen um, this, this kind of authoritar modern authoritarian populace defeated, um, it's usually because they've, someone has successfully changed the subject um, and brought people back to, you know, real, you know, away from mythology, away from the lies, away from the culture war, away from the distraction, you know, away from the, 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 the you know, the sort of fake arguments and, and, and on, to, on to the things that unify us and the things that we can do together. Okay, I'd, I'd like to turn to the audience quite shortly, but um, I wanna bring Nadia in on, on, on this discussion before I do so. Nadia, you've thought very, very deeply about these questions over, over many years. And this, I mean, Anne, Anne says she doesn't wanna talk about populism. She wants to talk about authoritarianism. The way that, the way that I see it, and you know, reading your work and the work of other people like um, the, the Levitsky and Ziblatt book about how democracies die, that often it starts with populism, but then it, it drives you inexorably towards authoritarianism and you say into, into fascism and the end of democracy. So how can democracy push back? How can politics push back against this anti-political force? What, what, what hints would you have for us from your work? Well, I, I think I'm going back to what uh, Rory was, was saying about that. It is uh, re electoral representative democracy cannot survive without party forms of politics. 
I don't know what kind of parties, parties can change their identities and the character, but organizations or some uh, intermediary bodies, political intermediary bodies capable of uh, um, creating representative claims, uh, unifying or separating them, uh, trying to convey interests without uh, making them directly into uh, the system, into the political system. This kind of uh, ruling the gap between the outside of the inside is crucial. If we are incapable of reorganizing that uh, kind of war that Bernard Crick, or one of my, my, my leader, my authors, Bernard Crick in, the, in defense of politics, is precisely creating the condition for accountability, for trust versus faith. This political, uh, this uh, um, populist leaders, what do they do? They practice direct representation, which is a blasphemy, which is a, a um, you know, an absurd, because they are in a permanent and direct relation to the people and the media, the new uh, internet system, they allow them to do so. And as they reiterate their message, they make people believe that they are like me, we are like us, what Anne was saying, uh, well, the, the Americans, they love uh, uh, Trump's uh, precisely for his immorality is what in, um, in Italy the people love Berlusconi for his immoralities. But simply because they, and he, they wanted to be seen as like us. We are all like us. And, for, and representation in politics has to do the opposite of that. It's not like us. It is on the contrary. It, we are different from you. And this difference is important because you can judge uh, what we do. So, but in, but if we are like us, nobody is judging. There is no accountability. There is simply, you know, trust me, have faith in me. I will. So this is the award that we have to uh, today with we, we have to face. And the the method we have in mind, compromise, pluriparty, uh, is a classical, traditional method. I don't know how much we can use this method with these uh, new medias, uh, a new internet, uh, with uh, the global interconnections that makes state and nations less powerful and less capable of promises that people to do, because this is an issue, promises what people, what, they can, what the government can do for the people. There is not much to promise now for many countries what we can, they can do for people. So this is kind of uh, comple com complexity of questions and issues that make us, I, I feel in this case, half pessimism and half optimist. Uh, because it's a, a tour de force that democracy needs to face in order to put a, a, a limit to this um, kind of flow of populist rhetoric uh, through um, not only in the, in the States, almost everywhere, I would say. Thank you very much. Um, we've got some really interesting questions coming in. So I'm gonna throw it out now to some audience questions. Um, I'm communicating behind the scenes with people and I hope this is gonna work right. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna call questions from Liam Wright uh, and Catherine White. Um, but while uh, Abby gets that set up behind the scenes, I've also got a question here that the questioner wanted me to read out. I think they're all related, these questions. I'm not sure whether this person wants their name uh, read out, and I'm going to struggle to pronounce it anyway. So let's just say this is a question from Timo. Um, do moderate conservative politicians share some blame for the transformation of centrist conservative parties to populist parties, e.g. the Republicans and the Tories? For an example, during the Brexit process, the media was dominated by extreme voices in the Tory party, but moderates preferred to stay quiet and try to preserve party discipline. This is maybe in line with what Rory was saying, um, leading in the end to an almost complete loss against the fringes. Very in line with what Rory said, but the, the role of uh, centre-right politicians to hold back this tide, I think is a really important theme that comes across in what some of you are saying, what other people have said that I've read. Um, Liam, would you like to ask your question? I think you can unmute yourself. Catherine is unmuted. Let's start with Catherine then, if that's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it was really, I think we're all aware of, of the 
what looks like game playing from the current Conservative government around uh, various um, intimidatory gestures towards uh, a institution such as, as the, the judiciary. Um, and it was really how far do you think the UK government could go in terms of uh, one party state tendencies before a wider social societal consensus uh, brought that back into line as we're now seeing in the United States? And Lee, I'm sorry, you, you unmuted and you muted again. <laughs> Please unmute and ask your question. Oh, hi, sorry about that. Um, so my question was uh, sort of really mainly in response to what Rory was talking about in terms of uh, simple and complex politics, the messaging that's used by either. And I was wondering if populist like campaigning, including that simple kind of rhetoric, uh, can be used effectively by politicians who are not populists. So how, how far can people dabble with populism before starting us on this whole slippery slope? Nadia, would you like to go, go first and maybe pick up some of the general themes and then I'll bring in Rory and, and, and Anne, both of whom obviously know British politics very well, to pick up a bit more on the British resonances of some of this. Okay, just a few issues and a few questions that came, that came during the conversation in my mind, actually. Now, um, the question of blaming the centrists or the moderates for uh, not having done what it was possible to do in order to stop and to stop in advance, perhaps this uh, explosion of uh, simplification, polarizations, and uh, um, irresponsibility of leadership. Yes, I think this is an issue, but there's another issue, maybe you connected perhaps to this one: the collapse of the distinction between right and left. In the in the attempt to uh, to look for median voters, both. Uh, spectrum, both parties or groups or, or coalitions, they tend to look similar uh, to each other. And this gave already the impression to be already in a kind of populistic, uh, you know, generality in which everything is mixed and everything can be organized. And it's enough to have a leader blaming on uh, um, on the establishment in order to do uh, the, um, the magic of uh, unifying finally all these uh, masses of non, no longer uh, party kind of loyals, uh, loyal citizens. So this is an important issue. Can democracy, representative democracy, parliamentary democracy survive without distinction and borders uh, into one position, my camp? Mine is a left camp, you are a, central left camp, you are a right wing camp, but it's a camp with some limitation. That is, you cannot simply want to amass uh, all the voters and that's to become practically an, an introduction to populism. This is an introduction to populism. This has happened in my country and it, it was very visible. The second very quick issue I would like to, uh, to, um, to, um, to ask, perhaps to ask myself to ask, to um, do you really think do you really think this is for Roy, but also Anne, that uh, this is simply to do with the political, is simply a political issue? Of course, we study politics. This is our, our you know, uh, topic. But this situation or many conditions or, or, or social or economic conditions are so different now as they were 30 years ago. Don't you think that this is also a very important uh, um, uh, topic to be analyzed in order to understand uh, uh, these, uh, these transformations. Thank you. Um, Anne, would you like to come in on some of these, the, the, this sure. question about the, the responsibility of people on the right? I mean, the, the, the Republicans in the US have come in for a lot of criticism for tolerating Trump, haven't they? Are we at risk of doing something similar here? So yes, I mean, the drama of the Republican Party over the last couple of years um, is something I've written about quite extensively. Um, um, and it, it, there, there has been a kind of bargain with the devil in that there were certainly people in the Senate and the cabinet, I'm not talking about ordinary voters, um, certainly people in the Senate and the cabinet who knew and understood that Trump was um, defying norms, in some cases breaking laws, um, doing harm to the country in, 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 in particularly in foreign policy, um, 
probably uh, using American foreign policy to make money for his company, you know, all these things that were completely out of bounds of US politics um, until, until he became president. Um, and, and since the election, as he carries forward this crazy conspiracy theory about, um, about, about having the election stolen from him, a shocking number of them, a shocking number have refused to come out and say openly that that's what's happening. Um, and so, yes, there is a responsibility. Um, and really, I mean, to exp in, in the United States, to explain it, you really need to begin thinking about occupied countries and the behavior of people in, in very extreme circumstances. Um, why are people giving up their values and everything they believe in um, for this man? And there's a complicated set of answers to do with, um, you know, their you know, stories they tell themselves about um, uh, you know, about the role they can play or the power they can have or the influence they can maintain or the, um, you know, or in some cases they're just afraid. They don't want him to tweet about them um, or they may be afraid of losing the election. So yes, I do think there's a, there's a huge responsibility, um, you know, on the part of quite a lot of the party. And then of course there's a small part of the party that broke off and actually campaigned against Trump and probably was played a very important role in convincing Republicans to vote against him. Um, I mean, in the UK, there's a separate issue. I mean, it's, I don't want to put it in the same, quite in the same category, which is why didn't moderate Tories do more to contradict um, the, the, the lies and propaganda about the EU years before? I mean, going back a decade, two decades. I, I, it's not so much that by the time we actually got to the Brexit referendum campaign, it was too late. Um, but quite a lot of stuff was, and, and by the way, the Labour Party has some role to play here too. Quite a lot of, um, you know, assumptions about EU bureaucracy and phony stories about what the EU does, or was allowed to kind of go because it was funny or it was popular or the tabloids were running with it. Um, and it really wasn't until the very last second when David Cameron and George Osborne suddenly woke up and said, "Oh my God, we're going to leave the EU," that they, you know, they mobilized themselves. Um, to argue to argue against it. So, so I mean, I think the the lesson certainly from the U.S. and the U.K. Um, is that these. And remember, by the way, what we're often talking about when we're talking about populist style politics, what we're also to, often talking about is lies and conspiracy theories and mythology, um, and the you know the need to confront this stuff and push back against it very early. Um, turns out to be very important. And by the way, I would say that would be true on the left and the right. I mean, that's not a, it's not a special right-wing issue. Um, but, 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 you know, you know, I, I mean, it is, you know, one of the things that social media has done for politics is that it's made it simply much easier to tell lies, to get away with lies, lies, exaggerations in some cases, um, you know, in some cases myths, in some cases um, simply leading people astray in different ways. Um, and some population, some, some, the politicians who've been unscrupulous enough to do it um, haven't really been blocked. Um, and this, by the way, is the answer to the, the, the question about um, can, the, can people on the other side use the same kind of tactics? Um, there is a lot of conversation about that, you know, in left wing and center right even parties. Um, can we do the same thing? And while I think it's true that, um, you know, liberals, center left and center right parties haven't, you know, haven't thought enough about how to campaign against this and often run very weak and ineffective campaigns. Um, the trouble that they all face is, do we want to use the same tactics? Do we also want to use, you know, you know, bot troll farms and bots? And are we also going to use mythology and, and conspiracy theory to support, um, to support our ideas? And most of them don't want to do that. Um, and this is why they've tried instead, as I said, these other tactics of you know, I don't know, getting people to talk about real stuff instead. Um, and some, some have been successful, but I mean, it is an absolutely, I mean, that is the key point. I mean, that is the, the essential problem of the opponents of populism is that they haven't found a good way to answer that political, that kind of political language and that, those kinds of tactics. Okay, Rory, can I bring you in in the UK? And this question about, you know, how much danger we should feel that we're in. I'm struck that you, you mentioned the prorogation. And if yeah. we're talking about center-right politicians, of course, when the prorogation was threatened, there were really fierce, there was really fierce opposition from people like Matt Hancock, who was also in the contest, as well as yourself. 
Um, but then when the prorogation happened, those people turned out to still be there. So yeah. should we worry so, so, about the same sort of phenomenon in the UK, do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, I struggle a bit with this. I mean, I, I think there's definitely something very strange about the fact that, um, you know, Matt Hancock was not only totally against prorogation, he also said that electing Boris Johnson on a no deal Brexit would be betraying everything that our ancestors had fought for on the Normandy beaches. And Michael Gove said that, you know, Boris Johnson was completely unfit to be prime minister and had therefore derailed his previous campaign. And both those people are now sitting in his cabinet. So there, there is a, there, there's, there's something strange there. Um, how one evaluates this in the great scheme of immorality and politics, I'm not quite sure. These may be slightly um, things that it's not worth sitting on too long. I mean, I think the, I, and I, I remain broadly speaking optimistic about Britain. I don't think our institutions are quite yet in the, the critical uh, problems that I'm really fearing that we're about to topple over into some authoritarian or fascist state. I, I think um, I was shocked by how far Boris was prepared to go. I was shocked by how far Dominic Cummings has been prepared to go, but in the end, um, I, I can't see, I, yeah, I'm not yet in a total state of panic. Um, but let me just return to the sort of uh, bigger issue that both Nadia and Anne was speaking about. Um, can, can moderates do better? Um, definitely. And I, I think that doesn't necessarily mean we need to go full on evil, right? The way that uh, center ground politicians win doesn't mean that we have to go fully down the, uh, the, the troll farms, the bots, the liars, the madness. I mean, I think there's a lot more that we could do uh, to be funny. I think there's a lot more that we could do to use social media well. I think our language is often really boring and technocratic and there's much more that we can do to be appealing. I mean, I think it makes sense to say to a politician, you've got an obligation to tell the truth, but you don't have an obligation to share in painful detail your thinking and your references and your statistics. I mean, nobody needs that, right? And we need to remember rhetoric is about appealing to people's emotions as well as to their intellect and center ground politicians often forget that. Um, I think we also um, need to rediscover a sense of outrage. We can make truth radical. We need to talk about things that really piss us off. And we need to convey that we actually have the energy to change things. That if somebody actually, you know, that we don't actually believe the world is terrific and the status quo is wonderful. Right? Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, if you were campaigning in Britain, you might want to say, listen, social care in Britain is a complete disgrace, right? I mean, I want to say, you know, prisons in Britain are a total disgrace. I mean, 5% of our citizens are living in completely inhuman conditions. I mean, this is something I'm really angry about and this is how I'm going to change it. And I have the energy and the confidence to change it. Um, however, that, that's the good story. That's why you might be optimistic about the center ground. The bad story is that the blocks, the challenges, the problems that a politician faces trying to do this are pretty considerable. Um, one of them is Nadia's bigger point about our surrounding culture, right? Our governments can do less than they used to be able to do. Uh, social media has completely disrupted the monopoly on information. Nation states, uh, panicking about their sovereignty. And the other side, and this is the other part, the other side of it, the populists have tools in their arsenal which it's difficult for the moderates to deploy. That's where Anne was talking about, you know, bots and trolls and the use of lies. Is, is, you know, these are powerful things. So um, I remain concerned that we are entering an age of populism, that this is not a temporary phenomenon, that we may well be for many years to come in this problem because there are certain structural implicit advantages that this type of campaigning has. Doesn't mean they're gonna win every time, right? I mean, if situations like COVID and economic collapse can destroy somebody like Trump, but generally speaking, all other things being equal, this style of campaigning fits with our modern culture and our modern age and gives them an inherent advantage over centrist politicians, which no amount of energy and passion and good humor uh, is likely to always be able to overcome. Thank you, Roy. Now, we're pushing up against time, but I've only taken one round of questions. So I know that two of our panelists have to be away in maximum 10 minutes. Can I just take a couple of extra questions? Uh, oh, one, one person's here already because we've been communicating behind the scenes. I was going to take a question from uh, Stephen Gosling and then a question from Tomas, Tomas, 
I'll leave it there because I won't pronounce his surname. Um, Stephen, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so in a UK context, to what extent would a consensual codified constitution have helped limit populism and bolster pragmatism? And I guess that's as much for you, Meg, as for the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, Stephen. And Tomasz. Hi, so I've got two questions, but I'll focus on the one. Ah, I was going to ask you your one about international organisations, please. Uh, right. Um, so seeing how the EU is quite hopeless in trying to presume, preserve the Polish government from destroying democracy, uh, to say quite officially, um, is there any way that any international organisation can actually try and limit what the government is doing or is it just the Polish problem that the Polish people has to deal with? So the relative weakness of the EU. Now, Stephen, I knew that you said you thought your question was partly pointed towards me. I'm going to completely refuse to answer that question, um, but I'm going to throw it to the rest of the panelists who are much better qualified to answer it than me, because I think that quite a lot of these other countries that we're talking about suffering from this problem have written constitutions. Mm -hmm. And yet people in the UK seem to think that that's some kind of silver bullet. Um, we could, we could Make well, let, let, let me sign off on that because it's I've only got 30 seconds to say on that, um, which is that I, I do believe this is a phenomenon that goes well beyond any specific constitution. I mean, we can see echoes of it in Turkey. We can see it in Poland and Hungary and the UK and the US and Italy. And I can go further. So I, I think, um, sadly, this is about a much broader global cultural phenomenon. And actually, in some ways, the analogy to think about is the extraordinary um, phenomenon of the Arab Spring, which again happened in the most incredible variety of different constitutional contexts and cultures very, very rapidly, because it was clearly a phenomenon that went well beyond national boundaries. Nadia, can I turn to you quickly on the question about international organizations and the role of the EU, perhaps? And then I'd like to end on Anne, because Anne is actually sitting in Poland right now. Uh, so um, and answer, the role of the EU in, in that particular part of the world is, I'm sure, something very close to her heart. I like to say two things though before uh, that question of the EU, which has to do with the transformation of democracy. I think Roy uh, is a, again right because here we are facing a kind of um, the sovereignty of the audience. The audience becomes the real actor here more than even the citizens with their own vote. And the audience means that the, the leaders are in a trap uh, every in every moment of their life to check uh, out how much they can rely upon the audience, whether they do, they do right or wrong. This is crucial because the idea of facticity uh, is completely gone. The question of uh, tasting what the audience thinks is already a fact by itself. And this um, nourish this, uh, you know, throwing doubts uh, on facts and, and creating a new kind of conspiracy, which is based on doubting on everything throwing doubts instead of uh, saying this is wrong or this is... So that is very important, audience and, uh, and doubts on facts. And, the, and then coming to, to you, I mean, the European Union is a great opportunity for strengthening democracy, not for weakening democracy. Because many countries, my country to begin with, uh, has been, thanks to the EU, uh, capable of strengthening democracy in the, in, in the last seven years. So I think this is crucial. The question is that uh, with the enlargement of Europe and this issue of unanimity in making decisions uh, and this issue of uh, impossibility of, uh, for the EU to interfere with the organization or the constitutional change inside of, of a state until a certain point, so, some can be done, but not completely. These uh, makes us think that Europe needs to make a jump ahead uh, with a more political organization and, and paradoxically more Europe, not less, but more political Europe in this case. And can I give you the last word? Sure. I mean, the EU is in a very difficult position vis-a-vis -vis Poland and Hungary um, because the EU wasn't really set up to police member states in that way. And it wasn't, it wasn't set up with the idea, it doesn't really have institutions that are designed to, to you know, to, to chastise countries that, that have violated their democracy. I mean, funnily enough, it's much better at chastising countries that have gone out of line economically. Somehow that's within its powers and, and democracy is not. 
So I have a little bit more sympathy for what the EU has tried to do over the last few years than, than the questioner does. Um, there has been a big EU presence in Poland. Um, there has been, you know, there have been commissions and studies there. Um, Franz Timmermans, one of the EU commissioners played a pretty big role here. He was here very often, he spoke about it. Um, and I think he had a big role in, help, in, in particularly initially in helping the opposition clarify and understand just exactly why the damage that was being done to the judicial system was so important, namely that it was going to bring Poland into a clash with the EU. Um, um, it's also my feeling that there is a level of fed upness now in Europe that is, that is, that is not so much in Germany, but in some smaller countries with this process and increasing willingness to find much more dramatic ways around, you know, certainly around this recent Polish and Hungarian veto. Um, and you might see um, a bit more, I mean, of what Nadia is describing, you know, you might see the EU becoming more political in the next few months for exactly that reason. I mean, the EU tends to change in reaction to crises, you know, crisis happens and then they have to make a decision to begin to behave differently. Um, and it, it's, it, it's possible that something like that will happen. Um, but the longer the longer answer is no, there aren't really any other international institutions that are set up to defend democracy in that way. Um, you know, the EU is much more unique in the world than I think even most of its members understand. I mean, it really is a you know a union a, you know a, a union that depends on the rule of law. Um, you know, because each member state has to be able to enforce EU law. Um, and therefore it depends on the, on the existence of democratic, democratic institutions in the way that other alliances really don't. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, NATO could still function if some of its members weren't democracies. And in fact, historically, some of them weren't. Um, and so it doesn't have quite the same power. And, and, the, the, and the EU's power of example has been, uh, you know, has been really important in both spreading and consolidating democracy um, on the European continent. Um, in the last year, but but there are simply limits to what outsiders can do. I mean, at the end of the day, democracy, you know, is about um, depends on the civic engagement of citizens um, and the willingness of citizens to understand and spend time on the issues, the willingness to campaign, to um, to vote, um, and. Um, you know, we may be experiencing a change in Poland in that regard, but in recent years, there's been a, you know, there's been a kind of upward limit, there's been a kind of apathy, and people haven't really believed that these changes were serious enough to bother them, and maybe that will change now, but really the, the most important changes have to come from within the country. So this is a sobering debate, and that's a sobering point to end on, that your words there, that there, there is no international institution to defend democracy. And in the UK, we also have no national institution to defend democracy. And this is something that struck me for many years as a, as a, as a, as a gap that ideally ought to have been filled a long time ago, but how, I don't know. Um, I want to end by thanking our panel for those fantastic contributions, that wonderfully rich debate. I, in all honesty, I think that you are a crack team and uh, maybe we could sort this out if we had a bit longer. Um, and if there are institutions to be established, you'd be right at the top of my list to be designers of those institutions. So I would love to keep this conversation going. I hope that this conversation with or without UCL is going to keep going because it's a phenomenally important one around the world and those people who've thought deeply about this need to be thinking about the solutions and not just analyzing the problems and that's been one of the refreshing things this evening that you've addressed that so thank you to our panel thank you to our audience for being here apologies uh, for all of you who wanted to get questions in and couldn't um, I hope that you will let people know about the video of this event I hope that you will consider coming to our future events this is the last policy and practice session for this year, um, but we'll be back on the 14th of January, uh, where we've got another former cabinet minister on our panel, Jack Straw, will be talking about oh. being foreign secretary. Um, so look out for the news about that and our other events. If you're not already registered to hear about constitution unit events when they come up, then I'd encourage you to go to our website and register for those. 
Uh, we've actually got one tomorrow uh, about devolution and the future of the union in the UK, and it's not too late to register for that. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Um, goodbye for now and hope to see you again another time. Bye. Bye.